I V M. Before we move on with this episode of the Scene in the Unseen, do check out another awesome podcast from IVM Podcast, Cyrus Says, hosted by my old buddy Cyrus Brocha. मेरे पिया, ओ मेरे पिया गए रंगून, किया है वहाँ से टेलीफोन, तुम्हारी याद सताती है, तुम्हारी याद सताती है, जिया में आग लगाती है। हम छोर के हिंदुस्तान बहुत पछताए बहुत पछताए हम छोर के हिंदुस्तान बहुत पछताए बहुत पछताए हुई भूल जो तुमको साथ न लेकर आए हुई भूल जो तुमको साथ न लेकर आए हम बर्मा की गलियों में और तुम हो देहरादून तुम्हारी याद सताती है तुम्हारी याद सताती है जिया में आग लगाती है वेलकम टू द सीन एंड द अनसीन our weekly podcast on economics, politics and behavioral science. Please welcome your host, Amit Varma. Welcome to the scene in the unseen. I'm a migrant, but I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly where I am from. My father was born in Lahore in 1941 and moved with partition to Bengal and grew up in Calcutta. There he met my mother, a Bengali, and married her after a scandalous love affair that was a talk of the town. I was a product of this marriage between Punjab and Bengal and was born in Chandigarh but spoke Bengali at home and ate fish every day. I went to college in Pune and I've lived in Mumbai for the last 24 years. Where am I from? I can't quite say but I'm an Indian and like all Indians at some level or another I am a migrant My guest today is Chinmay Tumbe who teaches at IIM Ahmedabad and is the author of a marvelous book called India Moving India Moving is a history of a country on the move it documents migrations out of India into India and within India and tells a story of a society that has always been in flux it's a riveting read as a book of history and it also carries much sociological insight into what makes us what we are a nation shaped and defined by its diversity Before we get to the conversation though let's take a quick commercial break This episode of the Seen and the Unseen is brought to you by Storytel. Storytel is an audiobook platform which you can listen to on your Android or iOS app. They have thousands of audiobooks that you can listen to on your mobile including hundreds in local languages like Hindi and Marathi and unlimited monthly subscription costs only rupees 2.99 per month and you can also get a 30 day free trial if you hop on over to storytel.com/ivm. I actually use Storytel myself regularly so as long as they sponsor the show I'm going to recommend one book a week that I love. The book I want to recommend today is by an author who is an indian favorite certainly of my generation when we were growing up it's pg woodhouse and the name of the book is my man jeeves but there are plenty of other books by him on storytel and remember you get a 30 day free trial only at storytel.com/ivm chinmay welcome to the scene in the unseen thanks Uh, so before we can you know, start talking about your book tell me a little bit about yourself i mean you've written a book on migration are you a sort of migrant yourself yeah like pretty much everyone in this city pretty much everyone in india i think you know migration has hugely influenced my sort of education and career path uh started off in a boarding school so you can say i started off you know moving at a very young age and i've been pretty much i think in the last 6 years i moved five different cities oh. so so i've definitely been much more you know on the move and that kind of reflects i guess in the book and you were trained as a political scientist no trained as an economist okay. uh, but i wrote my phd on migration history okay but it's sort of the economic impact of migration and this book in a way is uh, after that i did a lot of other research and this book is in a way a culmination of about 10 years of research starting with my phd and one of the things that struck me while reading this book is you know i've done a number of episodes with historians like ram guha srinath raghavan uh, manu pille and one of the things that struck me reading this book is that this is really a fairly deeply researched book of history as well was that a sort of skill that you had to train yourself in given that you were trained in economics before this How absolutely completely self trained i've never taken a course in history after my class 10 mm. so history is all about reading a lot i spent a year a year and a half in the us as a house husband where i just read a lot uh and so i think that really trained me into uh you know uh, reading the core aspect of course most of my reading is in economic history migration of course is linked uh, heavily into that uh and then i got an opportunity to start teaching history at i am in the bath when i where i moved there in 2016 uh and uh, in fact the seminar be organizing a conference on history at ima so i'm definitely into this field of business economic history and migration is a lovely subject because you can look at it from practically every discipline whether it's law or sociology or economics and so on 
Uh, and so my PhD thesis was fairly interdisciplinary. And so I thought, okay, I should just, you know, extend that. Uh, so though I didn't have a background in, in history, uh, I think this reading over the last 10 years and then professionally going to different conferences and just meeting different people uh, has helped tremendously in sort of shaping uh, my thoughts. When I was studying in London, uh, they had a department of economics, which I was part of, but I used to audit the courses in the department of economic history. It's probably the only university in the world, LSE, which has a specialized department of economic history. So I think that's where the interest really got seeded. And uh, since then, I read something on history every day. And you're right, this book is heavily, heavily researched. Uh, it cites, I think, more than 500 studies. And uh, uh, it's, 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 it's been a lot of fun because a lot of uh, the challenges to get this in an accessible way uh, and, uh, you know, this book, I thought there should be at least some book which uh, brings out this rich history. And, and does the quality of your reading change when you know you're writing a book like this? And let's say you're reading partly for pleasure because obviously you love the subject, but also you're reading to gather in all the information. Does it change the way you read? Do you stop more often to take notes or to, you know, look at the bibliography and get those other books? How does it work? Yeah, I mean... I think this is, a, I call this a semi-academic book. So it's got the academic stuff, but it's also written for the general audience. Uh, and so the more challenging part, I think the academic stuff is simpler in the sense you get some books, you know, you, you make some notes and that's fine. But it's really how do you intersperse popular culture? How do you get the sort of really day-to-day -day anecdotes, conversations into the book? Uh, and there's so much that one can get in a book on migration, but one has to be really selective. Uh, and so that has, you know, that's, I think, taken more time in uh, passing through a variety of things. For example, songs. There's so many songs on migration. But I've chosen some which I thought, you know, were really, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I thought that was an iconic song of migration. And it's really worked because I actually asked around, I chose a few songs and then this song seemed to be, uh, of course it was apt because I was talking about Burma in that chapter. Uh, but that song, it's incredible the resonance I've received. People across India have said, you know, that song is, uh, or they've just flipped through the book and bought the book because they song saw that particular quote and it's really resonated book. multiple levels because a lot of the questions I'm going to ask you later can easily, you know, go back to that song in the sense that it sort of shows the loneliness and the longing you feel for a loved one. It also sort of is almost a commentary on gender in the sense it's a wife who's left back and it's a husband who's gone. And also, to me, it never really struck me because I'm born in a generation, as are you, where uh, Indians don't really migrate to Rangoon anymore. And and uh, reading your book in that sense was a revelation in, in terms of figuring out that, you know, Burma was such a uh, huge uh, source of uh, Indian migration. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Burma, f for the East Coast, it was like what today the Persian Gulf is for the West Coast. Rangoon 100 years back is what we see Dubai today. Uh, it's, it's almost like a mirror image 100 years back and today. And, uh, you know, people, even if you look at the city of Mumbai, I mean, the diamond dealers like Ketan Mehta, after his wife, this Leela of the hospital is built. Ketan Mehta started off in Burma. Uh, and then, you know, a lot of people had to leave Burma eventually. So a lot of capital was there in Burma, different communities. I mean, of course, a lot of people are jailed as well. In Burma, had a famous jail. Tilak, most famously, was there. And let's not forget that the last king of Burma himself was uh, exiled in Ratnagri, which is not too far from here. In fact, you point out the very interesting parallel that, uh, uh, you know, Tilak was a migrant from Ratnagiri and when he was jailed in Burma, the king of Burma was jailed in Ratnagiri. Yeah, absolutely. Was, at, at the same time. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty wild. Getting to your book, you begin by pointing out that there are traditionally two routes to diversity, which are basically, uh, one is through migration and the other is through isolation and the lack of migration. And you point out that there's often been a misconception about what makes India so diverse diverse and that is one sort and not the other can you elaborate yeah i mean you know if you look at languages for example we feel that we're very proud that india is such a diverse uh, country but actually there's some like this papua new guinea which has more languages than india and that's because the islands never talked to each other they didn't have the sort of technology to bridge that so the, the question is you know in india we know for a fact that communities are very isolated in the sense even today in inter-community marriages are very practically non-existent as per some survey the india human development survey large nationally representative survey, uh, something like 94% of Indians still marry within their own castes and communities. So so this is a very highly endogamous society. But what's interesting is even though people are marrying within their groups, they're still moving. Uh, and in that process, this, there's a transfer of language, culture, custom. So what I argue is, I mean, is this, what I ask is that, is it the case that all these communities were sitting isolated and you know, bang, you have the British coming and then you have independence and then they've been forged into a common nation. Uh, 
And what I find is actually that people have been on the move, whether it's for not and not just for pilgrimage. They've been moving for work. They've been moving for a variety of reasons. Uh, and the most fundamental form of migration, of course, is marriage. And uh, more women have moved permanently in India than men uh, for marriage. Uh, and it's not necessarily just the neighboring village. So they also go, you know, at least 100 kilometers, uh, many, many busts. Uh, and because it's such strong sun preference in some parts, you know, women are moving uh, more than 100 kilometers in many places. And it's actually these small, small migrations, which at the margin are spreading or diffusing different cultures, especially when you see linguistic overlap. So where does a Kannada speaking boundary end? And where does a Marathi speaker or where does a Telugu speaker start? These sort of, these marginal linguistic boundaries are in a way sort of, you know, massaged through these marriage migrations because it's the woman of the household who often marries into a different linguistic background, same caste but different linguistic, and she learns the language. And so this is a sort of bridge. It's a very subtle bridge. Nobody sees this as migration, but it's actually these millions of women migrations on almost a day-to-day -day basis that actually what I argue is the invisible threads that hold India's diversity, and, uh, and to paraphrase and Nehru. And I guess along with the languages, it's also then an intermingling of other parts of culture, like our cuisines and, Absolutely. you know, all of which is a melting pot. I mean, I'll come back to caste later because you've got a lot of insights on that in your book. And what, what you just kind of said about endogamy reminded me of a quote from David Reich's book, uh, Who We Are and How We Got Here, where he speaks about how India is not really one large population. Uh, in his words, the Han Chinese would be one large population. India is really a collection of many, many, many small populations because of the caste system uh, over the last. Uh, 2000 years has been very little intermarriage uh, but as you're pointing out that doesn't mean that there hasn't been intermingling of cultures there has been a, a whole amount and a lot of that is uh, because of migration now about three months back I did an episode with Tony Joseph on his book The Early Indians so uh, which is also I guess in a sense about migration Absolutely, yeah. but that kind of covers early India so you get a sense of yeah. okay you know there was a migration out of Africa mm -hmm. and then um, there was the Indus Valley civilization which was the early India and the sort of stations and then later you have the Aryan migration and so on and so forth and that's kind of where his book uh, leaves off having covered that part and you sort of mentioned that briefly in your first chapter but you know then you sort of go on to talk about how forces like geography and the weather shaped migration from that part on and particularly how the Indo-Gangetic plain which uh, is a sort of a, a hub and spoke of all the uh, migrations that have been happening here uh, which now contains 10% of the world's population how, how the centre kind of shifted there can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, we still don't know exactly how or when this you know uh, centre shifted from the Indus Valley to uh, Bihar but as I say, two of the most famous migrants, arguably, are, you know, Buddha and Mahavir, both associated with Bihar, not necessarily born there. Uh, and what's fascinating for me is that today Bihar is the epitome of out-migration, whereas 2,000 years back, it was arguably, you know, the sort of Asia's number one hotbed for in-migration. You had students visiting Nalanda University from far and so on. Uh, so this is a really rich culture. It's very dense, which it is even today. And it's a culture which is kind of, you know, it probably are relatively much richer than the rest, and it's gone into relative decline over several centuries. These migrations have happened through multiple kinds. One, of course, is through the wandering ascetic. So that's the pilgrimage and, you know, variety of forms. But there's a particular social group called the Brahmanas, which in the first millennium is very important. And in a way, you can't understand the spread of Hindu thought, Hindu philosophy, consolidation, without understanding the travels of Shankaracharya or understanding even the geography of the Indian subcontinent where you have these four marts placed in four different corners. So they kind of map out the geography. Uh, and this is important because actually we don't have good records of maps. Uh, before the arrival of the Europeans, actually no record that we visually mapped out spaces. But clearly we were very good with directions and we knew you know, uh, how to get from one place to the other. So this Migration of the social group of Brahmana is very interesting because they were given orders by the king to go and settle down and collect taxes from people. Uh, and so this is the first real record that we have of migration that comes in the first millennium. Now, you can argue that almost every war required some migration, marriage would require some migration. But something which is mentioned clearly in the scriptures as to so and so move from here to here comes from this migration of this particular social group. Uh, and I would argue that it's very important to understand how Hindu sort of thought really consolidated in the subcontinent. Because we think today that, you know, Hinduism is, for example, the default. Uh, 
But in the first millennium, there were actually various philosophical thoughts. We could have been a completely Jain country. We could have been a completely Buddhist country. But ultimately, as we say, about 70% or 80% of the subcontinent today is Hindu. Uh, and these migrations were important to consolidate. Uh, and and were these migrations of the Brahmanas purposeful in that sense that, uh, you know, a, a sort of a religious uh, colonialism that we want to spread Hinduism and this is how we do it? Was it kind of purposeful in that I way? I don't think we have enough evidence of that. But clearly, these were, you can call it land-based colonialism in the sense that they were given villages to sort of maintain, collect taxes and, of course, send the taxes back. So we know that, you know, there's a relationship between where the people are going and the sort of metropole. And you have numerous inscriptions and many books written on this, but uh, especially Orissa. I mean, if you ask, you know, why does Orissa have so many of these uh, temples and uh, centers which came? And we find more, a lot of these inscriptions suggest that there was this massive migration towards Orissa uh, sometime in this first millennium. So these are the stray references to migration. They are the outsiders. So, for example, even Alexander's armies, there's, there's references to Indians being taken back to Europe as soldiers and so on. And when I was doing research on this period, I found it's very interesting because you never really think of Indians being in Europe 2,000 years back. Uh, but apparently some of them were, you know, uh, maybe a handful. Uh, but there are actually references to that. In fact, you've got a reference somewhere in your book, if I remember correctly, to 15,000 people in Armenia. Yes. <laughs> Which was pretty wild because I'd be like, okay, are there 15,000 Indians in Armenia today? No, I don't. <laughs> I doubt it, yeah. And it's, it's one of those mysteries because... Uh, it's, it's always tough to understand exact numbers, but uh, this is one of those loose ends where we there's some evidence that people were there, but we don't know what happened after. So they were either wiped out or some, they got completely assimilated or converted. We don't know. Uh, and there are a lot of stories uh, you know, like that. The, the fascinating stories, of course, of the Romas, of the gypsies in Europe. And uh, now there's genetic evidence which suggests that they sort of went out of northwest India. Uh, but interestingly, they were just not you know, not West Punjabi, so to speak, but they belong to the low-ranking castes. So the genetic studies map out very closely with particular castes and them. So it's very interesting as to how different social groups have had different sort of types of patterns of mobility throughout history. And that's an important theme of this book. Trajectories. And, and you, you know, you write uh, elsewhere in your book that migration is one way of resistance against oppression. You know, it's like the, the political scientist Rio Hirschman said that if you don't like the regime you're in, you can either leave, complain or comply. And um, migration is a common way. People just leave. And, uh, you know, one maybe doesn't know the historical circumstances, but the fact that it's uh, lower caste who you know, who uh, migrated in this uh, instance is uh, telling in a way. It's, it's, it's very interesting that, you know, given that India is basically not just composed of, but uh, populated by migration. It's interesting that for a long time, we had a negative attitude towards out-migration. You know, we would call outsiders, as you write in your book, the Mlechas, and uh, there would be these myths about how you lose your caste if you cross the Kalapani and so on. I mean, I remember reading Gandhi's biography also, where uh, uh, Gandhi was, uh, you know, for a while ostracized by his fellow cast members because he went to England to study and uh, uh, so on. That's kind of curious, isn't it? For, for Absolutely. I mean, when I started writing this book, actually, uh, because I do more, most of my hist historical work in the last 200 years, and so it's very challenging to, you know, understand the past before that. And I assume that, you know, the passport release was a major instrument devised in the early 20th century which curtailed mobility. But as I did, was started to stumble across more sources, I realized actually mobility has always been, it was never, there was never really a world in the last 2000 years where everyone could move anyhow they felt like. So in the Artha Shastra, you have clear references of like a passport, spies, or like control officers in kingdoms. So it's not the case that you could just pick up your bag and go anywhere, unless it's a pilgrimage. It's also unsafe and so on. But the social norm, as you said, has been so strong. This idea of crossing the you know, Kalapani and the forbidden waters, the dark waters. And the idea that you would lose your caste upon return has been such a strong driving force. So much so that about 15 years back, there was a temple priest fight in Udupi. And one priest actually, you know, tried to pull, pull the other down by saying, this fellow actually went to the US. So it was, it was a notion alive even in the 21st century, this idea of the Kalapani. But as I argue, in the 19th century, when these colonial sort of overseas recruitment migration started, it also flipped. And for a lot of people who wanted to lose their caste, the idea that you could lose your caste actually became very attractive. Uh, and so while a lot of the literature actually sees indentured migrations as exploitation, uh, 
I would see that a lot of it is was exploitation, but a lot of it was also driven by people who wanted to leave because they wanted a better future. It's not that the people who didn't leave were having a very you know idyllic life. There's a lot of exploitation in India as well, and so it's a sort of relative choices people were making, and a lot of people sort of left, and a lot of people actually benefited. by these uh, migrations they were choosing it in contrast to something even worse you do have lots of exceptions you mentioned in your book like most intriguingly the 12000 indian musicians who were taken to uh, iran by the persian king uh, bahram gore then you come to sort of medieval migrations and you said that in the medieval period from the 13th century to the early 18th century there were three major changes that increased special mobility that increased migration uh, tell me yeah, about what, this what, the first was of course what really happens in this period is that delhi becomes a major power center but most importantly for the first time delhi is connected to both figuratively you know the east coast and the west coast so this opens tremendous opportunities of maritime trade merging with inland trade so till then it was always separate uh, you also had urbanization in the sense a lot of large cities coming up of uh, delhi but also by the end of the period surat and so on as a result of which a lot of people started moving to these places and finally there's there also pilgrimage networks which started and you had different religious not maybe faiths but philosophies so you have the sufi wanderers then you have the sort of vaishnav uh, pushti margi vaishnavism which is a new form of uh, philosophical thought which emerges you have the sikhism emerges as a religion and all of these i argue actually a lot of these religions had a much more benevolent outlook towards not only trade but also migration and so there were less taboos of sort of moving in many philosophies so arguably the pace of mobility increased note also there's time of a lot of warfare and so there's what is called as a you know, economists would call as a military labor market and this is different because you have full time warriors but when the size of the army grows you also have need to have part time warriors and so you also have like agriculturalists coming into warfare uh and many of the dominant you know uh, sort of warfare warrior groups of india consolidated themselves in this period like the rajputs and the marathas for example uh and this is important because some of these mobility streams continued well into the recent past that is we're talking of 200 years uh, earlier so there's some districts of india which supplied the soldiers you know uh, in saran for example in bihar supplied the soldiers to the shah suri army then the mughal armies then the british the bengal native infantry and then uh, much later to the industrial sort of uh, mills of calcutta so it's the same region sending out people and that becomes a sort of pattern for many parts so the development of a military labor market in this medieval time uh, city building which became very big and this integration of inland trade with overland and overseas trade so these sort of three major factors really uh, boosted mobility in a big note that the speed didn't change much essentially for until the advent of the railways the speed of the horse was the constraint but because of this demand for variety of uh, economic sort of needs mobility increased tremendously no i find it really intriguing the way you sort of uh, describe the military labor market I, it's almost like there's a gig economy and you can just turn on an uber for warriors and figure out which is the most profitable war for you to go to another thing that uh, struck me as very interesting and i hadn't really thought about it in this way before was that a lot of the urbanization like you point out in south india was temple generated urbanization uh, you know benefiting merchants and artisans whereas typically we today we think of urbanization as driven by economic imperatives you want to form larger economic economic networks and so on but uh, you know religion being a force in both urbanization and migration was really interesting what i also found uh, fascinating uh, was your uh, a whole account of slavery like typically when we talk about slavery we obviously imagine the american south and the civil war and so on and so forth but india was a market for slaves in both directions tell me a bit about that yeah i mean slavery has been mentioned since the times of the arthashastra maybe even before different types of slaves we are accustomed to think of slaves usually as men but in indian history you also have a lot of accounts of female slavery whether it's in the chola empire the rajputs uh, the mughals so so women slaves have always been there in this time period for roughly 15 to 18th century especially when in the us and south america and north america this transatlantic slave trade really began india really you know developed two or three major circuits one was from africa to india via arabia and the most fascinating community which exists till date is the siddhi community who trace their ancestry to this uh, sort of group and i there's a famous guy called malik ambar who becomes this big noble in the ahmednagar dynasty uh, 
and he comes from Ethiopia to Arabia to what we would call as Maharashtra today. And he comes as a slave and he rises up to be a fairly rich man with a lot of power. And he, Jahangir hates him because he's, you know, thwarting the Mughal attack uh, in the Deccan. And his descendants, you know, I mean, the community has a huge setback. The slave imports stop after they sort of lose uh, wars. Uh, but the community still exists today. And so in some, some parts of the Afri- uh, in Gujarat, for example, uh, even Maharashtra, you'll find uh, black skinned people uh, with sort of African ethnicity uh, living today. Uh, and I work in at IMM Ahmedabad, and our logo actually comes from the Siddhi Syed Jali Mosque, which is designed by these artisans coming from this community. So I often tell students actually that, you know, uh, when you, th- you have to really think twice before send- selling Fair and Lovely because you have, uh, you know, uh, your, the logo of your institute uh, was designed uh, originally by a black, a descendant of a black African slave. Uh, in terms of slavery on the other side, and this is a less known fact, one theory of why the mountains Hindu Kush are called Silo is because they were killer of Hindus in the sense Hindu slaves being taken over the mountains uh, because of the cold. And so there's a huge slave market also of Indians or people, mainly Hindus, being taken over the Hindu Kush to the slave markets of Persia and Central Asia. So there's a circuit from Africa and Arabia coming to India, but there's also a circuit from India going into Asia. Again, even in North India, slave dynasties existed. So very interesting ways in which slavery existed. Of course, very harsh. But I would argue compared to the US experience, or the experience of the American world, a lot of avenues for upward mobility, which we've still not really found in the American world. And I think that's a distinctive aspect of slavery in India. Many people have been able to break. It was never sacrosanct. You could always sort of rise to the top if some accident happened. Like Malik Ambar and the slave dynasty with Iltul Mission all. But, but I guess those are the slaves that we've imported, but might be slightly harder for slaves that we export to other places. Yeah, we don't know enough. Again, this is a slightly mm. mismatch in the records. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, in fact, talk about the slogan in Central Asia when slaves would be taken there. The slogan mm. being slaves from India, horses from Parthia. Yeah. <laughs> which is something you can imagine on the side of a medieval billboard. And you also have a mention of in the early 17th century, some 18,000 Bengali slaves in two small centers of the Arakan, which is uh, North Burma, which is also kind of uh, quite uh, fascinating. Yeah. Then we And it's the same channel of this Rohingya migration today. Okay. So, so it's it's interesting because we are talking about, th- about three to four centuries back, Bengali slaves being taken hmm. to Burma, and today we have a reverse sort of an issue of refugee trafficking on the other sort of channel. And the Rohingyas are basically the descendants of migrants who went from modern day Bangladesh, yeah. right? Essentially, yeah. yeah. Right. And and then we sort of come to colonialism, which obviously has a, a bunch of different impacts. But one of the interesting things they try to do, which harks back to what you said about, you know, there never really being freedom of mobility anywhere, uh, is that they try to cut down on migrating groups like the Banjaras and try to make them settle down for reasons of both surveillance and, I guess, taxation, because a state just wants to be an efficient state. Yeah, I mean, we think of the British. I mean, if you ask, you know, did the British increase patient mobility or did they f- uh, fall? You probably think of the railways, the steamboats, and say, obviously, people started moving more, which is true. But there are a lot of, again, and this is the thing, some social groups started moving more and some social groups started moving less. And the less ones are people who were sort of negatively impacted were precisely those groups who are historically always on the move. These are basically the nomadic groups and the most famous being the Banjaras, famous in logistics, called different names in different parts of India. Uh, in Hyderabad, you have the Banjara Hills, for example, which, which comes from that. And the Banjaras you know, really affected because one, the transport systems are being shifted. So there's a technology shock. Two, there's a surveillance shock where they need to be settled down in different places. And you can really see sort of, you know, communities getting poorer as a result of this. So this is one way in which a lot of communities became richer thanks to colonial rule, but some communities became poorer. And definitely the ones which are on the move historically definitely saw a lot of, uh, and they're some of the poorest social groups even today in India. And I was just coming from the other and the other station, the porters, uh, even today, they trace the ancestry to this group. And as I sort of write in, in the book, it's sort of slightly ironic because they were displaced by the railways in the first place. Uh, 
and today they're sort of working on the railways. It's going to come for full circle, and it's even more ironic because a lot of the other communities and castes which migrate often do it for specific purposes. They go for jobs or marriages or whatever. And you could say with people like the Banjaras that uh, the journey was a destination. They, you know, it was part of their culture to travel and to have that taken away uh, would have been. Yeah, it was deeply traumatic, and that's why many of the revolts. also started coming from these social groups again we don't know too much about those revolts but on the whole there's been this mixed effect you know definitely some groups especially the coastal india got this massive positive shock on movement that is a lot of people started to move because the british connected the whole world in a major way and so this whole overseas migration started in a big way right um the second chapter of your book is called the great indian migration wave and what you say about that later is a great indian migration wave is arguably the largest and longest non coerced migration stream for work in documented history stop quote uh, elaborate on that a bit so when we talk migration in indian history it's remarkable that if you ask the average person they talk of two migrations one is the aryan migration hypothesis many thousand years back and then you come to the 19th century and people talk of indentured migration and that's about it and the, my reason of and this i would say is the core sort of contribution of this book is to give a phrase to one of the world's greatest migrations and these are migrations which are male dominated as argue that are three core features male dominated remittance based semi permanent and they're happening pretty much even today so you know when you see the ratnagari people in mumbai most of them do not settle down in mumbai they go back and this has been happening since the middle of the 19th century a lot of my research has been to document these regions which are these regions go there and find out more it's remarkable almost the entire west coast on one side of the western ghats from ratnagri to kanyakumari are part of this a large part of the coastal tracts on in eastern india a whole chunk of eastern up western bihar uttarakhand pretty much all of central india and the deccan is actually out of it they were not really affected by it. so this is a story of mostly coastal india and the low indo gangetic belt and what happened out here is that a lot of initial recruitment took place in the colonial era not necessarily by force density was very high in these places but these migrations have now led to a culture of migration where young boys grow up thinking that they will spend their life time outside and come back that's also key and girls grow up knowing that they have to look after the family and land when their husbands are away and it's so strongly rooted in many parts of india and my sort of estimate suggests that you know these districts if you are there about more than 150 districts out of about 600 districts of india which have this another way of saying it is there over regions covering over 200 million people which are completely remittance based economies principles sort of economy runs on money coming from outside and it has been going on since more than 140 years So if you compare it with other epochs uh this actually turns out to be the largest and longest the largest migration right now is the urbanization of china so china has you know taken hundreds of millions of people out from farms to cities but that's happened in the last 30 years what's happened in india much smaller compared to chinese urbanization but it's been happening for more than 100 years so the classic indicator for this is the sex ratio and in india you know we typically sex ratios of 800 900 females to 1000 males uh in some parts as well and we are used to this phenomenon of the missing women but ratnagri many districts in india have the phenomenon of missing men and in ratnagri for example the sex ratio has never dipped below 1100 uh females to 1000 males so it's a female surplus because the men are working outside in fact you you point out that this is not just true at a given point in time but between 1872 and 2011 that's yeah. a heck of a long time it never dipped below no time. census has recorded it at till date and the ratnagri is of course is very extreme but a very similar story especially if you get the age group 25 to 40 you will find it in azamgarh in up in udupi in south india in sivaganga in tamil nadu so there virtually every state of india has a few districts which have become these remittance economies and there's very strong networks which enable these migrations to sustain in time. udupi in fact if uh, between 1901 to 2011 it never fell below 1090 females per 1000 males uh, you know in your chapter you mentioned a number of places and uh, like you mentioned saran and bihar their sex ratio in 1901 had risen to 1200 females per 1000 males yeah, and if you go to the taluks and villages it's 1400 1500 
Oh. And so this this is it's it's a massive phenomenon. You know? What are the cultural impacts of something like this? You would think that you know fertility reduces because the men are away, but that's not the case. Because as I argue, you just need one good night in order to sort of uh, you know get a kid. And these these migrants do come back. It's not like they're away for years. They come back at least once or twice a year. So it's re- remarkable. As a researcher, I thought fertility would be affected, but clearly, you know, Bihar has very high fertility even today. We might think that women would get more autonomy in the sense that the men are away, so they'd have to take more decisions. And that is true in some parts of India. Uh, but on the whole, not much has changed. What has changed though, on the West Coast is that with some decent governance, they've been able to use these remittances in a smarter way. And you could say that migration has fundamentally transformed this region for the good. In Bihar and Eastern UP, however, it's been much, much less. And uh, Ratnagiri is a particularly interesting case because, you know, a common phrase in uh, Ratnagiri was, I mean, they looked at Mumbai as something really aspirational. A common phrase you've quoted is, Jechik Holi Techi Mumbai, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Yeah. Mumbai belongs to uh, those who own a room. And it's it's very interesting that a lot of the luminaries of Mumbai and indeed India are migrants from Ratnagiri. Uh, uh, you say here that, you know, 10% of all awardees of the Bharat Ratna have been given to people directly or indirectly or associated with mass mass migration from this region, like, I assume, uh, uh, the Mangeshkars and so on. Absolutely. It's, it's a remarkable region. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, we remember, as I say, Ratnagri is famous for mangoes, but it's also famous for mangoes, you know, so <laughs> it's, it's this massive uh, migration uh, effect. Uh, its contribution has really been, truly been outsized. But, I mean, Ratnagri, of course, is, the Konkan is one uh, region, but of course, there are many other regions of India who have also you know, exported. Uh, it, and it, for example, the Udupi cluster, you know, all the South Indian restaurants that you see across India, most of them are actually run by the Udupi guys. And it's a remarkable story of how a guy goes, learns the sort of tricks of the trade and then starts a new restaurant. And it's just like this, literally like a McDonald's franchisee model, uh, but very indigenous, many years before McDonald's, and really spread its sort of tentacles across And India. part of it is almost happenstance, isn't it? Because you mentioned that there was a flood in the region in 1923 Absolutely. and a lot of people were forced to migrate because of uh, uh, that and, and this turned out to be a natural sort Often of you have one starting shock which starts yeah. pushing out. More recently, the diamond industry got this massive shock in the 1980s. That's why a lot of the Saurashtra Patels got into this business. Uh, more recently, just, you know, uh, a lot of Bengalis are now in the sort of gold business like this goldsmith kind of business and from literally Kochi in the south to Surat uh, most small towns and cities these are a particular sort of Bengali community which is, which is managing and again they had a massive sort of natural calamity in the 80s because of which many people went out many of these other regions also there were a lot of famines in the late 19th century but it's almost all of India was affected by famines so it's not just the fact that there was something bad uh, there's a negative shock but it at the same time, like you said, happenstance where they find an opportunity. And that, that is the combination which clicks. So while famines affected all, pretty much all of India, it's the coastal areas where they had the opportunity to go to Burma, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, or anywhere to work, that they found this safety wolf, where they realized that if there's a famine, they could always go there. But as much of deck in India, though there was famine, they, they tried to move, but they couldn't you know, get an opportunity uh, to latch on to. And as a result of which... Even though they had negative shocks, they didn't sort of cultivate these migration networks uh, so much. Today, of course, some parts of the Deccan are into migration streams, northern Karnataka, for example, and some parts of Maharashtra. Uh, there's something you wrote about uh, Udupi, which kind of brings me to a larger question. What you wrote was, quote, Migration from Udupi was unique in that it involved a considerable number of child migrants in search of work. And the key destination, the restaurant, provided free food and Accommodation, stop quote. And, and my question really isn't about the child migrants, so that's an interesting uh, uh, thing in itself. But it's about how a common thread through all the communities and peoples that you uh, describe in this, whether it's the Parsis or the Sindhis or the Marwaris or the Gujaratis, all of whom we'll talk about later in this episode. But a common thread to all of them is the force of community as a force multiplier. So that if you want a better life, 
uh, you just see where your community has gone and you can be guaranteed that you'll go there and you'll either get a place to work and learn the trade as in the case of an ODP restaurant or uh, in the case of say Marwaris or Gujaratis you might even get uh, funding from those community networks and what therefore happens is that number one communities tend to specialize in certain kind of trades or vocations and this almost then seems to have in a way a ghettoization effect like I was chatting with a friend who was brought up in Surat uh, on the show in fact I did an episode with Akar Patel on uh, Hindutva and Akar was brought up in Surat and while he was describing Surat we realized that Surat was both simultaneously globalized and ghettoized that you had uh, communities from across the world kind of gathering there to trade and to intermingle but they were also deeply ghettoized and it seems that that ghettoization uh, or the strengthening of those community bonds is almost uh, inevitable it is as much a feature as a bug because that's what makes it um, happen. How, how do you see the two sides of this and the trade-offs involved? I think the reason why communities are still so close-knit is because it sustains itself through marriage. And so the number one reason is marriage rules. It's also linked with the age at marriage. Even today, Indian women, for its sort of per capita uh, income, marry at an extremely young age. We say, you know, 18 is a legal age for women to marry. But when you look at surveys, the median age for marriage is among women t- today is 18, which means half the population of India today, even today, women marry below 18. And this is the way community has its grip, you know, because if you can control marriage and if you can control marriage within your community, that's how it remains close-knit. The minute sort of women, for example, can work till 25, 30 and then choose their own partners, if that freedom is given, then this, this community networks break down. So that's the big trade-off. And I would, of course, argue that, you know, uh, women should be working or should be getting married at much uh, sort of uh, later age groups and so on. Of course, the strange part about this is that, as you said, communities work as major agents of subsidies. They subsidize accommodation, food, networks, especially if you're going. And so what's interesting is some of the social groups which have been not in business or not in sort of the, you know, money-making activities – the way they have stormed these things is using the network and using the community. And so you'll see this in the Sarashtra Patels who move from farming to business, the Gaunders in South India from, again, farming to business, and now slowly some sort of you know, what people are calling as Dalit capitalism, where Dalits themselves are using their networks. And so when you have some, a body like the Dalit you know, Dikki, uh, which is a Dalit industry in Chambers Commerce of India, it's basically a front, just as you would have a Marwadi Samaj, for example. So they've realized the power of the community. And so what's interesting to me is that everyone now in India is trying to come up through a community ladder. Which is great, but historically, as you point out uh, at various points in your book, it's much harder for someone from a lower caste to really come up because there are barriers to entry. For example, if you want to be in the diamond trade, you basically got to be one of the Palanpuri gens and so on. So what you have is that, you know, the trade that the Marwaris control or the trade that the Gujaratis control or, you know, across those, they almost have a stranglehold on it where it's very easy for someone from their community to get a step up and become um, prominent. But that kind of upward mobility within that specific trade is much harder for somebody from the outside and as you correctly point out that one reason why the lower castes both migrated less and benefited less from migration is because they didn't have access to these networks. I mean it's a good thing that they're now getting built up and it's also a good thing that barriers to entry are sort of less than they were across professions. Yeah, I mean this is a wonderful book by Devesh Kapoor and others called I think Define the Odds. It's it's basically a profile on Dalit entrepreneurs. And what they find, you know, is is remarkable that when they look at commonalities of success, even more than reservations or the factors, it's actually migration. The ability to go out, to develop new networks, and about the ability to fail, but be anonymous. Which means that if you fail, oftentimes you start something different and you fail and immediately your community says, you know, you were not really born to do this. There's a huge psychological setups of what you can and cannot do. And migration is remarkable because it puts you in settings in which nobody knows you and in situations where you can't fail. And I think that's really the power of migration. I no better person than Ambedkar who really realized this power. And that's why Ambedkar was a huge champion of migration. It helped him in his personal life. And, you know, he uh, advocated. And so if you see in Dalit activist circles today, historically, there were these mottos of uh, educate, agitate and so on. 
uh, today migrate is also you know coming into that uh, timeline and uh, interesting international migration so a lot of it is now okay now we need to go abroad and cross and the kalapani as it cross the kalapani <laughs> and uh, sort of uh, you know uh, reclaim the space in fact you point to three recent memoirs which also underscored this narendra jadav's untouchables daya pawar's baluta sujata gidlas and samang elephants which is an excellent book which uh, talk about how international or uh, internal migration are linked with the beginning of uh, social emancipation let's take a quick commercial break and we'll come back after that Hello everybody, welcome to another awesome week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you're not following us on social media, please make sure you do. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. One more reminder, we are still hiring. We're looking for producers, content creators, audio engineers, developers, and basically all kinds of people. Go on to our careers page, ivmpodcast.com slash careers, and apply. Please send us your resume, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Also wanted to make a note to you all that, hey, if you are listening to us and you hear something you like, take a screenshot of what you're doing, send it to us on social media, tag us on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or wherever, and we'll repost you on our own page. This week, your favorite fitness podcaster, Urmi Kothari, is back with season two of the Kinetic Living podcast. Urmi is doing two bite-sized episodes every week, the Bata Tuesdays, which will be a four-minute workout, and a second called Thriving Thursdays, where Urmi will share motivating personal experiences of challenges she's faced. On Cyrus Says, actor and improviser Mukul Chadda talks to Cyrus about his central role in the Indian adaptation of The Office, the process of adapting the scripts, and how he went from being a research analyst in New York to an actor and improviser in Mumbai. On the first episode of Tech Careers in the New, presented by Accenture, Sheila Ditya is in conversation with Sanjeev Narsipur. He's the managing director and blockchain lead at Accenture Technology Services, and they talk about blockchain, its real-world practical applications, and what it takes to have a career in this space. On IVM Likes, IVM staffers delve deeper into the universe of independent and parallel cinema. On the habit coach Ashton talks about never missing Mondays. He also talks about maintaining the momentum and owning that habit. On ATKT Talent, then Peeman and Krupa are joined by Sai, a rapper and Kala, a music producer and rapper. They talk about their ATKT journey, the first songs they composed and produced together and collaborations with other rappers. On Not Just Dance Up, Parsan talks to Roxanne Bambot and Maruk Mogrelia about immersive Parsi food experiences like Parsi food walks and home dining. On What a Player, Siddharth, Mikhail and Akash review the previous week of the ongoing ICC Cricket World Cup, preview the upcoming week along with some unusual predictions and give out their What a Player of the Week. On the Pragati podcast, Pranay Kotasthane returns to help us understand how fiscal federalism works in India. And with that, let's continue on with your show. Welcome back to The Scene and the Unseen. I'm chatting with uh, Chinmay Tumbe about his very fine book, India Moving, A History of Migration. You know, before the break, we were uh, discussing various sort of communities where the female to male ratio has gone out of whack and there are missing men because men cannot leave. And, and the interesting thing, as I was going through the list of these communities, uh, is that they're all sort of migrating from different social circumstances for different reasons. Like, uh, you know, the whole Ratnagiri and going to Mumbai uh, or Bombay as it then was is one thing with Udupi it's kind of the restaurant trade perhaps helped along by the happenstance of a cyclone and other events which come together and then they're completely Mm. the flood sorry and they're completely dominating that and then there's Saran and Bihar which is uh, really interesting where the sex ratio in fact at one point rose to 1200 females for 1000 males tell me a little bit about that yeah so Saran as I said it has this really long history starting many centuries ago and Saran is one of the few districts of India where you can trace the migration history because there are three different historians who wrote about its migration for three different separate centuries. Uh, the first people in Singapore, for example, from the the British side was the, the Bengal Native Infantry. And these were soldiers f- recruited from Saran. And so in the 19th century, some of the major sort of infantry stock was coming from Saran. And as British rule sort of consolidated itself, actually the demand for army personnel sort of started reducing. In fact, if you compare the Mughal army and the British army, the British army is very thin. And so this whole military labor market which had developed was beginning to collapse, which means people who were on the move historically had to find new vacations. And so people from Saran actually got hold of the jute mills in Calcutta. And so they became just like Ratnagri labor fueled the cotton textile industries of Bombay. It was Saran labor which sort of got hold of the uh, jute industries. And one company, for example, Saran labor from across the 20th century, I think it went from being about one fourth to three fourths of the workforce. So again, a very strong network built between Saran and Calcutta. The fourth district I talk about is Ganjam in Orissa. And I call it cyclone psychology because Ganjam is a very unfortunate geography. All cyclones tend to end up, you know, battering Ganjam. Uh, it's faced some sort of a super cyclone once in 15 years. And so 100 years back, they were going to Burma. Today, they go to Surat, Gujarat, uh, work in a variety of, you know, urban sectors. In Surat, it's the synthetic textiles and so on. But it's a culture which 
kind of has come to the conclusion that if we just focus on our agriculture, it's very risky because the super cyclone is going to come once in 10, 15 years. And so migration relatively is a very stable livelihood strategy. It can be harsh, it can be exploitative, it has all the social costs of separation, loneliness. But given the realities of climate, it's a very safe and I would say smart strategy that they've sort of developed over the last 100 years. And in all these places, they have the money orders, they have the migration songs, the folk songs. So this is a huge sort of, it's very similar. I mean, if you go to Ratnagri, if you go to Gunjam, if you go to Udupi, if you go to Saran, differences in development, but that migration culture that you'll find that the kind of conversations they're having, it's remarkably similar. And in fact, you give an interesting statistic here that the number of migrants from Ganjam to Surat are more than a lakh, uh, more yeah. than 100,000. Yeah. And, and that's interesting. And the point you make elsewhere in the book is that it might seem strange or counterintuitive that if you are, uh, say, in a village in uh, Odisha or wherever, you don't go to the nearest town or the nearest city, you go all the way to Surat. Yeah. But the reason is that's where your community is. So in a different sense, in a, with a different kind of geography in mind, that is actually the place closest to you. Absolutely. I mean, if you look at Bombay, you might think that, you know, Madhya Pradesh is closer to Bombay than Uttar Pradesh. You might think that many more people from Madhya Pradesh should be in Bombay than Uttar Pradesh. But it's completely the reverse. Uh, UP is further, but we have more. And that's because once a network starts, it is so strong because it helps you find jobs. It helps you find accommodation. Above all, information. It's about the, it's migration is all about information. What information do you know about the destination place? How safe is that place? Uh, a lot of, you'll see a lot of migrant families diversifying nowadays. Same household, three sons, two daughters, the three sons will go to three different cities. And so from household perspective, it's also like a, you know, diver- it's like a portfolio diversification. You're hedging your bets. Yeah. Right. And, and uh, not just sort of these places, but it's almost you talk about how cluster, there are these clusters and corridors all along the coast on either side, all the way down and then all the way around the coast and back up again. And, and I particularly found it uh, interesting that Goa, which is where everyone wants to go, is where there was a lot of out migration. People yeah. wanted to leave Goa. Goa is India's biggest remittance economy for a long time until the 1960s. And some taluks even today are remittance economies. Uh, not many people know that, you know, uh, most people love to go to Goa, but the, a lot of Goans actually work outside, especially in the Merchant Navy. So when they did this migration survey, they had to actually keep an option, you know, where are you outside India? They had to keep an option saying no man's land. And that was that returned the most number of sort of uh, responses. Uh, there was a Goa migration survey done and they found that in taluks like Barde Salset, uh, about one third of the households were receiving money from outside. That's pretty much the same number in Kerala or Ratnagri. That's mass migration, however you define it where one third of households are receiving money. And that's happening in Goa today. I mean, the survey was done about six years back. Uh, but of course, it's not all of Goa today. So Goa is n- today an aberration on the West Coast, from Kanyakumari to Ratnagri, some parts of Goa. And that's because, of course, a lot of the population permanently left after this Portuguese separation to Portugal or Mozambique. Uh, but a lot of Goans also started developing new things because it, became, it faced this massive tourism boom. And so a lot of construction activities started happening in Goa, etc. Vizag is another place where a lot of people used to leave. They built the port and they start more migration towards Vizag rather than from it. In fact, there was a you know very nice little tidbit in your book about how uh, Goan Catholics became uh, so good at baking that that's how they got the name Makapau. Apparently, that's the, the you know, uh, moniker that they got. Uh, it's a story. Many of these stories, it's very hard to verify. But apparently, this is... Uh, considered to be the source of uh, the word Mak- Makapau that we use. And, you know, in Bandra and Kar, it's, it's full of this particular population. Right. And Kerala also has been obviously very famously uh, an area from which there's been a, a lot of out-migration. I, you know, we should probably, for listeners who may not uh, be completely clear about this, maybe clarify the terms. What's the difference between emigration, immigration and migration? Yeah, emigration... In today's context, is out of country. So people leaving India, going outside. Immigration is people coming in, into India. So for example, Nepalese or Bangladesh is coming to India or Mexicans going to US. So they're called Mexican immigrants in the US. And we say migrants or internal migrants for, you know, uh, people within the country. You might ask, who is a migrant? In the census, there are two options. You can be a migrant based on the place of birth, which means if I'm born in Pune and I'm living on the day the census office arrives in Bombay for more than six months, six months is the cutoff, uh, then I'm a migrant on the basis of place of birth. Uh, 
But you'll see that, suppose I was in Pune and I moved to Bombay, spent 10 years and I went back to Pune. And if the census officer asked me in Pune, you, you know, what's your place of birth? I say Pune and I am in Pune. Then I would be not a, not a migrant. So in order to capture moves, they ask you a question, what is your last place of residence? And so in that case, technically, you should be saying Bombay. Uh, as it turns out, there are a lot of biases in migration surveys. Uh, and Kerala is a classic example. One, uh, the census and the national sample survey ask, you know, question, what is your previous place of residence? Now, we know almost a, a third of the workforce of Kerala has a Gulf connection. But surprisingly, very few people answer saying that their last place of residence was the Gulf. Because for them, home is Kerala. As a result, in the census and the national sample service, we find very few, you, you would conclude that there's very little Gulf connection. There's another survey done by a research center there, large sample size, and just a very specific question. Have you gone to the Gulf and how many years you spent there? And it turns out one third of the you know, population has a Gulf connection. So it matters as to how you ask the question and how a person relates to a particular place. There's a big gulf between this kind of question and that kind of question. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So Kerala has always, again, as you point out, you know, been incredibly open to outside influences. You know, their maritime trade has been flourishing for a long time. That's probably where uh, Islam and Christianity first came to India from. And now they are known for their high rates of uh, out-migration. Is it sort of a question of cultural openness to... Uh, it could be. I mean, the fact that they've, you know, had this coastal culture for centuries definitely is part of the story but this out migration started in a big way partly also because they got they were one of the most highly educated states of India even in the early 20th century within India relatively the most educated and it's a position they've had till date but it's it's a case of a highly educated state with less job opportunities and so you've seen a lot of educated young people leave Kerala uh, both men and women and go all across India first and then in the last 30 years, the Gulf and then US and a variety of places. Uh, interestingly, the Gulf story starts with Mumbai. Uh, the first recruitment offices of the oil companies were in Mumbai in the 1930s and 40s. And interestingly, they had some norms as to who they could recruit. And so it was the Keralites in Mumbai who got those jobs. And that's how the network started. And so from Mumbai, the locus shifted to Kerala. And that's why you have you know this massive Kerala. When the Gulf started booming in the 70s and 80s, when oil prices boomed, construction activity started and this Kerala connection was formed. And so today in popular culture in Kerala, you know, massive, massive migration uh, from Kerala. Of course, now there's a lot of migration to Kerala as well. Because Kerala is fairly rich. They don't want to do the low-end jobs. And so you have the curious case of more than 2 million North Indians now working in Kerala. And there's just a Malayali movie just released where uh, the film sort of breaks into a song and the song is sung in Bengali. So there's a Bengali song in a you know, Malayali film. That's uh, pretty wild. <laughs> yeah. Later in your chapter on the Great Indian Migration Wave, you sum it up by saying, uh, quote, the Great Indian Migration Wave has for the most part been voluntary in nature. It represents an adventure, the ability to break out of the family's gaze and yet be able to support it, to enjoy the city lights and the company of friends and relatives, and finally to return home with the satisfaction of a life well spent, at least in the eyes of the others. For many, though, this would not have been the case as life would have cruel twists in store. Stop quote. And you're obviously referring here to indentured labor, which was a significant um, factor in out-migration of Indians all across the world. Uh, yeah, in the 19th century, definitely. As I said, it's some have called it a new form of slavery. I don't use that word. I think indenture, a lot of people strategically chose indenture as a way to get out. But there's no doubt that they were harsh contracts, however you see it. One way to see it is when, you know, Gandhi and the national movement, one of the first sticking points for them was the indentured migration. And they got it banned. They got it abolished uh, in the 1910s. But the interesting thing is when they got indentured as a system abolished, but the migration didn't stop. People continued to move. They, they switched destinations, but they started. They continued. So the pressure to migrate was always there. Apart from indenture, of course, it's exploitation on a day-to-day -day basis, people eviction, you know, insecure sort of land rights, as a result of which migrants in India, they, they lead fairly insecure lives. That is why this connection with the home is so important, because they know that they can always fall back on something. Uh, and so they never really snap the connection with the rural place, even if an entire family has moved. Uh, for example, my father's side family comes from Udupi, and it's the rare Udupi family which actually settled in Mumbai. Uh, I mean, of course, they're Lots, hundreds and you know, thousands of 
Udupi families which have settled in Mumbai. But I would argue that's the minority. Most actually go back. Uh, and the minute you settle down, the kids get education. And over some time, generations, the root with Udupi itself snaps. So for example, today I really don't go to Udupi you know, every now and then, but there's a closer connection with the previous generation. Uh, you know, writing of indentured labor, for example, you write, quote, between 1831 and 1920, two million people were transported across continents through indenture contracts. One third towards the Caribbean, one fourth towards Mauritius, a tenth towards South Africa, and the rest scattered in numerous islands and regions, including Fiji, Cuba, Peru, and Hawaii. Uh, stop quote. And, and the interesting thing is that a lot of these places are now, you know, heavily populated with Indians. Like, I think more than half of Mauritians are uh, uh, Indians and, uh, you know, in Britain. British Guyana, French yeah. Guyana, Trinidad and Tobago, they've kind of uh, Huge uh, settled shares, down yeah. everywhere. They, even the political, I mean, in Mauritius, for example, Hujpuri is still a language, you know, it's a language alive. Uh, every, you know, Mauritius major political leader has had some sort of an Indian ethnic uh, root. And it's not surprising that when they come to India, they have to make a stop to Bihar. Because the, most of these migrants to Mauritius and the Caribbean, they trace their roots to the indo gangetic plains. For example, V.S. Naipaul himself, uh, you know, wrote these books and his heritage also comes from that part of the world. And it's kind of ironic that all of these uh, sort of descendants of people who migrated from Bihar and uh, so on are, are now doing much better than their so-called, you know, their, their fifth cousins or their sixth cousins or whatever. Yeah, I mean, that's a very good observation. And it is true, relative to Bihar, but there's a huge diversity. So Mauritius is spectacular. It's got a per capita income many, many times, India many, many times, Bihar's. But there are also places like in the Caribbean which are not that great. Uh, there's Guyana, for example, which is still you know fairly poor. Uh, there's Fiji, where Indians have not been treated well and is also fairly poor. So I think the experience has sort of uh, varied. But it, it would be a mistake to say that, you know, hence they made the right choice. I think it's not fair to judge the legacy, but rather the choice they made at that particular time. For example, you might even say that, you know, it's good slavery happened in the transatlantic world because the African-Americans in the U.S., are better off than Africans. Uh, but I think that would be a bit harsh on the whole process of slavery and, and so on. No, I mean, the, 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 the significant thing about that observation, for example, is what it tells you is that there's not something inherent in the people which stops Absolutely, them from developing yeah. or progress. In, or given whatever. the right institutions, climate, you will flourish. Yeah. And Indians have been very successful abroad. Exactly. Then we come to sort of two of the major impetuses towards uh, progress. Uh, the first of them being the railways. Tell me a bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it started in this you know city, the first line, 1853, completely transformed the speed of transport, completely. Some say it really unified India. Massive role in migration because you know people started uh, moving. It's on the cover of the book as well. I did a lot of my research, interviewing people in the general compartment ends. That's pretty much where migrant India moves of uh, trains. Uh, so train is a very special symbol of migration in India, both voluntary migration on a day-to-day -day basis, but also involuntary migration like the partition, where you had these death trains, Kushwan Singh's famous train to Pakistan, for example. So from, you know, life, death, and as I like to say, even love, so many people have found partners in trains, uh, like my parents who first met in a Bombay local train. So uh, this train is just a unique metaphor for, for various things in Indian life, but especially migration. And and the second institution which uh, you describe is a post office. Yeah, and I argue that it's been even more important. You know, travel happened through railways, but travel happened before the railways. And even after the railways came, most people from Ratnagri, Kerala were coming to Bombay by steamers. So there was also water transport. But the one thing migrant workers used everywhere was the postal money order. And the postal money order was remarkable because it's the first mass financial instrument which everyone could relate to. India had a unique system. In 1884, they realized, it was launched in 1880. Four years later, they realized that most of the recipients were women. They were not coming to the offices to collect the cash. So they changed the system to make it home delivery of cash. And it's a system, unique system only in India, which survived until it was shut down. The entire system was shut down a few years ago. And so for more than 100 years, you had a system of home delivery of cash. And that's why the postman became this symbol in many parts of India of like this messiah because he would come he would undo his bag and you know, there'd be money there'd be physical cash uh, out there and so there are songs on this uh, variety of you know theatrical uh, uh, incidences based on this uh, particular character uh, and I spend a lot of my time actually digging out 
information, old postal cards uh, on this because it also shows you that this remittance economy in India is not new. It's been there now for more than 100 years in many parts of India. No, in fact, you point out that, you know, it, uh, the postal money order traffic grew so much that it amounted to 2 to 3 percent of the gross domestic product between 1900 and the 1960s, which is a heck of a lot. And there are young millennials today who will not know what their postman looks like or they will not know what a money order is. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, yeah. But, sure. they, but they will see a Western Union board, which is the proxy for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let's talk about gender a bit now, because, uh, you know, one of the things that is, of course, obvious is that many of these uh, regions from which out migration is happening, the gender balance is skewed because the women stay at home. And you've spoken a bit about how this affects uh, how the social and cultural impacts of this. But it is also true that there were a lot of women who were sort of uh, migrating and not always for the most uh, welcome reasons. Uh, you know, you've got a, a section here on trafficking and female flight and all of that and there, there's a very um, telling quote you know which seems to indicate how people were forced to because of circumstances look upon their children as resources and your sentence sort of is um, quote in one official record in the late 19th century a cultivator's girl was made to swap with a prostitute's boy because apparently neither was of any use to their natural parents stop quote which is very poignant uh, yeah absolutely this book has also been a revelation to me because in terms of research i found remarkable sort of cases and instances just on which which makes you think about you know how india has been as a society uh and we know that india has not really been the best place you know for women uh and especially for migration you know when we think of harsh forms of migration women have been disproportionately been affected uh prostitution being massive uh i write in the book i mean it's not just indian women but european women who are trafficked into india because you have this huge british standing army almost completely men and, uh, you know, they had their own sexual needs. And so that's why there's this uh, importation of white women as, as they required. So the Devdasi form, people have said, is also a very, you know, harsh form of servitude. So varieties of, you know, problems related with female migration. And even when women are highly educated, when they go, to, for example, to the U.S., it's, I argue, a sort of, sort of brain drain where, you know, you're highly educated, you're going, but you're not getting work because you're not allowed to. Because most of the times it's the men who have the, you know, a visa, the H-1B, and the women have the H-4 visa and or the L-2. It's very tough to get work uh, because they have sort of laws which restrict you to, uh, from doing so. Uh, and so, as I say, they inevitably become these desperate housewives uh, in the U.S., I mean, even in these modern times, you have sort of uh, women bearing uh, the brunt of that. Let's kind of, uh, you know, move from the migration of labor to the migration of capital. And you talk about how that becomes uh, a force for a lot of migration. For example, the Parsis. And, you know, there's this famous myth about how the first Parsi merchant comes and the king of Gujarat, uh, Jadi Rana, tells him, why should I let you in? And uh, he asks for a glass of milk and he puts some sugar in it to indicate that, uh, you know, they'll assimilate but not overwhelm. Uh, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a very nice, you know, uh, quote and it tells you also how the community has gelled very well in India. It still maintains a strong identity. You know, but it's 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 a small community. It's dwindling in size, but again, its contributions have been outsized. You know, you look at virtually any sector, and Parsis have made just tremendous contributions. The one sector in which they've always sort of uh, blasted against was that they've never contributed to the army, and then you have a guy like Sam Manik Shaw you know, yeah. comes. <laughs> so, so even that has been saturated. Yeah. So, so tremendously outsized, and I think it boils down to a way of sort of an, a culture of excellence, which built into whatever occupation you take uh, at a very young age. And Bombay, of course, it helped that they were in Bombay, which is the most cosmopolitan city of India. Uh, and so they got the best you know, exposure to different things that were happening in the city. And so they leveraged, whether it was arts, whether it was business, you know, you have these pioneers in these fields. Even women, Parsi women have been trailblazers in law, like Cornelia Sorabji, a uh, variety of fields. So, so it is a tremendous community. But we should also not forget that, like many mercantile communities, the wealth really started with the opium trade. And, uh, you know, whether it's the uh, almost, I mean, this is not just the Parsis. Practically every community in China and India owed their wealth in the 19th century to the opium trade, which was basically narcotics. Including the Tatas with this stuff. <laughs> yeah, one could argue everything in a sense yeah. is the opium trade. Uh, do you think, and I'm just thinking aloud here, since you spoke about how uh, 
Parsis tend to, for whatever reasons, uh, strive towards excellence. You know, just as people talk of, say, the Protestant work ethic being a factor in uh, uh, how Europe did whatever they did, would you say that in many of the communities which you uh, describe uh, separately, uh, where you talk about the Sindhis, the Gujaratis, the Marwaris, and so on, and the Parsis, that each of them, can you pinpoint at the risk of generalizing, but are there sort of these cultural qualities which uh, carry through and therefore become a prominent part in the success of later generations. Like you could say, okay, the Marwaris are good at trading and doing deals and um, uh, whatever, all of that. Yeah, I'm usually very hesitant to give culturalist explanations to practically everything that might reflect the economic straining. Economists in general do not like culturalist explanations. Uh, but there's, there's no doubt that if you look at the Marwaris, for example, risk-taking appetite, competitiveness, it's tremendous. So there's definitely something in the community which, but I would I would say it's a network effect. You know, there's some there's like in migration, something starts it, and then there's this massive corridor which gets generated. I think it's a very very similar thing. So it's not got to do with Marwaris per se. You might have social groups you know, completely non business like who might be doing the same in two decades, but they need that one role model or one you know massive star to be born, and everyone become like that. Uh, and you've seen that you see that in football. Where you just see certain African countries become very good in football. Because they see these role models performing very well in Europe. And so I, I would boil it down to some strong early role models. And of course, in, in the world of business, capital matters. And so if capital is retained within a community, then everyone sort of, you know, benefits. Yeah. And a lot of people with sort of a, a, a North Indian bias may not kind of realize that one of the really significant communities in this aspect in India are the Chettiars from Chettinad in South India. At one point, you write, quote, at the peak of the power in the 1930s, estimates suggest that the Chettiards had 1650 firms in Burma, 1000 each in Malaysia and Singapore, 500 in Sri Lanka, 200 in French in Indochina, which is Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia, and 150 in other East Asian uh, regions. Stop quote. And, and, and that's quite mind-blowing and people don't at least, you know, uh, maybe it's my Amit bias, but people don't often uh, think of them in these terms. Absolutely. I mean, Chetia is, uh, is were the, by far the richest community in India. Again, like the Parsis, numbering just about 100,000. So it's not a very big community. Uh, these firms, of course, small firms, but still, as you can imagine, just the sheer number. Most of them in money lending, but then also in timber and then they start plantations. So really a very widespread transnational community at the early 20th century. And it's, it's a remarkable case of decline, actually, over the 20th century because they lose all their money in Burma uh, and sort of they really fall down. But uh, if you go to Chettinad even today, you'll see these houses, like if you go to, uh, you know, uh, parts of uh, close to Pilani in, in Rajasthan, where you see these Marwadi Havelis of old-style Havelis. In Chettinad, you have these Burmese teakwood houses even today, which is a reminder of this Burmese connection. Even today, there's a Burma investors group in of, of the Chettiars and they stake claim to land in Burma even today. They feel they were unfairly knocked out of Burma. Which so, they're not going to get. <laughs> which they're not, never going to get, but they've not yet lost hope. So, you know, reading about many of these, one of the things that is common between these groups that were responsible for the migration of uh, capital, whether it's the Khatris who were moneylenders or whether it's the Marwaris. In fact, in 1844, the Bombay Times and Journal of Commerce, which is now the Times of India, for whom I write a column, ran a brief piece called Beware of the Marwaris. And I want to quote from that. And the quote is in your book. Uh, quote, these Marwaris leave their own country for the purpose of trading and they are spread all over Hindustan. A Marwari shop may be seen as a hamlet may be seen in a hamlet consisting of only four or five cottages. In fact, were you to search all Hindustan, it would be difficult to find an agricultural village without a Marwari. When they arrive here, they commence by selling gram and in the course of four or five years, they become opulent bankers. The causes of this are their unjust dealings. Therefore, my advice to my countrymen is this, that they avoid entering into any transactions of this nature with such deceivers as these Top quote and for all my Marwari listeners, uh, these are not my words. I was quoting from <laughs> the Times of India. And this takes us back to a sort of this uh, very suspicious uh, outlook towards trade. Again, you quote from the Arthasastra, which is, you know, 1800 years old, which also refers to traders as quote, all thieves, in effect, if not name, and uh, the stop quote, and then says, uh, quote, they shall be prevented from oppressing the people. So a lot of these migrants were fundamentally both traders and moneylenders, um, professions yeah. looked upon with If you see, you know, after 1991, where this liberalization economic boom, a lot of people have 
kind of wrongly conclude that India has always been open to trade and so on. And I would argue that yes, but in only a few communities. Actually, the default, like the notion of Arthur Shastra, was this healthy skepticism towards trade. You can almost call it like this, you know, a culture where salvation is more important than making money. Uh, and you find that in many communities even today. And hence, when a lot of communities in India started making a lot of serious money in the 19th century, especially the Maharadis, there was a lot of opposition. And it's important because today when we see anti-immigrant uh, sort of, you know, views, in, whether it's in the US or UK or even in India, it's labor migration, you know, whether it's in the Northeast India or, or US, it's anti-labor migration. But there are also cases in history where there's anti-capital migration. And the classic example is Marwadi migration in India. And, you know, the Bengali nationalist PCRA called them parasites. Uh, the Chettiars were also abused and thrown out. Most famously in East Africa, Idi Amin kicked out, you know, Indian traders. And what's interesting is it's not sustainable because in any region you need some capital to grow with. And so whether it's East Africa who are actually wooing back the Indians who they kicked out 30 years back, they're actually wooing them back uh, to Kenya and Uganda today. And in the case of Times of India, of course, the ownership you know, moved on to Marwadi hands a hundred years later. Which is the ultimate revenge. <laughs> Take that bitch. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, speaking of uh, the Gujaratis getting kicked out of uh, East Africa, you, you know, 50,000 Partidars get kicked out of East Africa. A bunch of them go to the UK. And you've got a very nice anecdote about how, quote, in one local cricket match in Bradford in 2001, all 21 players on the field were Patels. The scorekeeper, himself a Patel, had the fairly amusing job of recording a scoreboard on the lines of Patel, caught Patel, Patel, bowl Patel. Patel, run out Patel, and, and so on. Stop. Yeah, yeah, they, they, yeah. <laughs> it, it's a remarkable cricket match. <laughs> yeah. Let's let's kind of move on to another significant section of your book, which is about the diaspora, which is about not the, the sort of internal migration, but uh, the diasporas uh, uh, that have uh, uh, formed. And you say that today there's a vast Indian diaspora of over 25 million people across the world. Tell me a little bit about this because one of the crucial points you also make is that these diasporas reside both within and outside India and the diaspora within India is double the size of the international diaspora. Yeah, this is actually not well known. For example, the number of people who speak Bengali, there are more people speaking Bengali within India outside the Bengali heartland than outside. Like me. Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't have thought I was Bengali, right? <laughs> and uh, this, this is also a surprise for me, except the Malayalis, I think. The Malayalis have this massive international diaspora. But as most Indian linguistic groups have a larger internal diaspora. And this is important because often the internal diasporas, firstly, what is a diaspora? A diaspora is basically a scattering of a particular you know, identity, whether it's a language or a ethnicity or a religion. And if you see the global diaspora is about 25 million, the internal diaspora, linguistic, I say it's about 60 million. And the internal diaspora is like a launch pad for the international diaspora. Often, like we said, you know, the Biharis who are now going to the Gulf are going via Kerala or through networks cultivated in Kerala. The Gujaratis who went outside, Bombay was a major launch pad, for example. Uh, so this is this matters. You know, these these small sort of connections uh, matter. Uh, the international diaspora is varied. It's so diverse. You have the old diaspora. That's, you can call it the plantation diaspora. So there were mainly sugar plantations, but there's rubber plantations, tea plantations, coffee plantations. And these are the guys who went to Mauritius, Fiji, and so on. And in a lot of those countries, Indian ethnic Indians now make up more than half the population. The new diaspora can be summarized as a U-turn, U meaning three U's. So that's US, UK, UAE. And these three countries specifically, you know, today attract a lot of Indians, a lot of investment, a lot of overseas investment, a lot of remittances comes from those places. And today, India, you know, earlier there were also concerns of brain drain and so on. Today, nobody talks so much. And the fundamental reason is India is today the world's largest recipient of international remittances. And we get more than $70 billion from people outside. It's about 2 to 3% of India's GDP. I mean, it's a huge part of the balance of payments. Without it, India would really be struggling. So we've kind of recognized the contribution of migrants from coming from outside. And a lot of this money comes from Gulf, which is on, you know, uh, which also has a lot of low-skill labor. A lot of it comes from the U.S., which is at the high-skill labor. Today's diaspora, however, slightly different from the old diaspora because it, it is much more elite in the sense the guys who are going out are disproportionately drawn from the upper castes. Uh, Religion-wise, it's different because in the Gulf, there's an over-representation of Muslims. In the U.S., over-representation of Hindus. But caste-wise, there's this massive gulf. Uh, 
uh, which was not the case 100 years back because it was almost like a cross section of an indian village would be found on a boat going to fiji but today when you see the plain it's not really a cross section of indian society so it's much more elite and in us uh, like the political scientist devish kapoor and others have called it the other 1% it's really an extremely elite diaspora so when we say you know indians are so brainy or or a classic comment i get is you know indians are very good at mathematics and they're looking at indians in the us but this is really the top end what you have you know had the privilege and like to go there. like you said you know it's not just a selection bias it's what you call the triple selection triple bias selection, yeah book. not i but yeah devish kapoor has, has said mm-hmm. that yeah and uh, and which is why indian americans outperform every subgroup in america in terms of income and education as 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 you write here uh, but it's not just the three us it's also southeast asia which is often ignored isn't it when it comes yeah. to looking at the diaspora southeast asia is, i mean if you look at the whole arc burma malaysia sri lanka th- this was the hub 100 years back burma and sri lanka have fallen out but malaysia singapore especially are still very strong so today i mean outside the three us singapore definitely is a huge hub for indians a uh, lot of indian entrepreneurs businessmen uh, and it's here in when you talk of diaspora inevitably we start talking about the sindhis because the sindhis are a group which have become so transnational i mean virtually every country gujaratis are another and punjabis so i would i would say you know sindhis punjabis and uh, gujaratis are probably most transnational and then the malayalis and tamils of course uh, kannadigas to a slightly less extent what's interesting is bengali diaspora of course we add bangladesh it's very wide but the sort of more recent uh, sort of migrations have been more internal that is you know from west bengal to uh, different parts of india but again what's not changed is that central india this whole arc of the deccan plateau and northeast india like 100 years back they are really not into this international migration in a big way why do you think that is and so again these historic networks i would argue that so less opportunity there for basically more like yeah the coasts have had sort of starting advantage because they've had these old ties and so they've just been synced with them because remember the british empire worked from three ports uh, delhi came much later it was bombay chennai or kolkata so the coastal sort of india had much a wider exposure to trade ideas movement uh, for international sort of connections uh, than the hinterland so there's this clear bias towards the coast rather than the hinterland in sort of independent india apart from delhi and now much more recently pune hyderabad bangalore but apart from that there's a huge part in the center which is kind of been sort of ignored or and with migration you need information and so it's only now that the information is percolating and so who knows in maybe 20 years down the line you'll find a lot of migration from these places uh in 2006 i traveled through pakistan i was covering india's cricket tour there uh, so i was there for a couple of months and one of the things that sort of struck me is that wherever i went people's sense of community identity was seemed stronger to me than their sense of being pakistani so for example with my friends in lahore it would be the punjabi identity was really strong, strong yeah. much more than the the sense of the idea of pakistan and at that point it seemed to me and this was probably a shallow observation but the idea of pakistan seemed weaker at that level than the idea of india but reading your book one thing i thought was that uh you know if you look at the histories of these communities and the way they've kind of stuck together through the centuries and they have these uh sort of um tides which uh, you know lift an entire community along or you know you actually have communities small communities getting uh, you know uh, displaced um, on mass as it were very often that it even seems that the idea of nation especially india which is just over 70 years old uh, seems relatively nebulous to the idea of community so you know much as i absolutely deplore identity politics for example i can also see why people naturally gravitate uh, towards it absolutely i mean the the central theme of a person growing up in india i mean is implicitly that and explicitly that you need to be within your fold right i mean that's so strongly ingrained into who you eat with who you live with spatial segregation and eventually who you marry with uh and these norms i would argue i mean of course they're breaking down but very slowly yeah. right and so as a result of which this community logic is is very strong Now, Raghun Ram Rajan has a new book, you know, called The Third Pillar, and he argues that one of the reasons for this kind of stuff you're seeing around the world today is that between f- markets and the state, there's also the community, and the community has been ignored, and that's I think that's a very interesting observation uh, that he's making. And uh, maybe uh, in India, I would argue that of course the community is 
have always been at the forefront, you know, whether it's for reservation or political thing. Specific communities have always been able to galvanize. And so it's, it's a very core part of the political process now. I mean, you could say that, uh, you know, it, it just simply works on community blocks. And and what are the sort of trade-offs involved there? Because on one hand, the advantage of being part of a community is that you, of course, have a sense of belonging and you have a sense of home, uh, not necessarily just in a geographical sense. And you also have access to all these networks and these people who will take care of you and so on. Uh, but the flip side of it is that can also be divisive. Though, I, I mean, I would argue if you look at India's history, it hasn't necessarily been divisive. You have so many communities sort of uh, coexisting and intermingling to mutual benefit. But it can be divisive and especially in these times where our politics becomes more and more polarized and divisive um, how do you see these sort of trade-offs playing out yeah it's, it's, a, it's a very good question i don't have any clear sort of you know answer to that uh, i just say like my experience has been when you talk to different friends right so if, if i talk to friends coming from the dalit backgrounds when i talk about community with them the the experience is much more of you know what are you talking about this is basically exploitation you can call it caste community. For us, it is exploitation. And I think one has to be very sensitive to that. Uh, whereas you talk with several other groups who have been more privileged, and like we discussed, you know, they're often seen as the outsiders. They now have a grouse that people are out to get us, right? Uh, for example, the Brahmins have this classic grouse that we were forced to move because of reservations. <laughs> you know, there's this huge uh, identity around that. So I think... These are the sort of different tensions in which each community is facing, some which justifiably have been exploited for long, and some which now feel that they're being exploited, uh, even though there might not be any evidence on that. So in a strange way, every community feels that they're being exploited. It's, it's a very unique sort of situation that we are in now. And I wonder if, uh, you know, some of these uh, resentments between communities or between peoples and uh, so on also comes from a, a kind of forced migration which you describe in the second half of your book, which is all the uh, displacement, displacements which have happened because of partition, for example, being a very uh, a big reason and not just one partition of 1947, but the multiple multiple partitions you uh, sort of uh, uh, point out, you know, the, the, the Bangladesh in 71, the Burma just before that. And all the displacements, for example, in 1990, the Kashmiri pundits being forced to flee. Thank yeah, another striking statistic in your book is about how two thirds of the people in Delhi are in some way migrants. At that um, time, especially in 1951. The census, uh, yeah. yeah, and and do you think that lingers on through the generations? Like, if you look at some of the sort of support for, say, Hindutva forces today, yeah. uh, would you say that some of it comes from memories and resentments? and therefore are not uh, all that hard to understand. Absolutely. I mean, if you look at Kashmiri Pandits, it's very obvious, you know, where the grouse is coming from. It was a painful incident. It was a horrendous incident, the, this whole Kashmiri Pandit exodus. Uh, but fundamentally, it's the same reasons. It's hyper-nationalism in Kashmir at that point. It's hyper-masculinity, uh, aggression. And unfortunately, this is being repeated now in different ways in, in, in India. Uh, partition, you're absolutely right. For example, the RSS would say that, you know, it is us who actually protected people at that point of time. So, you know, a uh, similar thing in Bombay. A lot of people love the Shiv Sena because they say, you know, in the 90s, during the riots, it's the Shiv Sena who stood up and protected us. And so this becomes a very solid part of the identity building process. And so there's a clear connection. I mean, Sindhis, for example, very, very closely aligned with you know, hardcore nationalist uh, feelings. There's also the case in the case of Sindhis of trying to prove themselves that they are Hindu in a very, very strong way. Uh, and so this kind of seems to dominate a lot of the logic because a lot of people, because they're often being taunted as being coming from the other side. Right? And so in order to sort of dismiss any notion of that, it kind of go to the other extreme and say, no, 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 we are, you know, you need to assert your identity even more. Uh, so I do think some of it, you know, comes up out in that way. I don't know if there's any empirical relation, like on average to Sindhis, uh, you know, are they more uh, uh, nationalist uh, than others? I don't know. But I, I can clearly see the reason why. And there's no, for example, Kashmir Pandit is very clear cut. Uh, it's it's a solid injustice which has been done against them. It's still not really been solved. It's still outside. Uh, 
and so this sort of resentment will obviously continue and uh, another question to i guess none of us will have an answer and i don't know if you can uh, get metrics for that either is that as the generations pass and the memories of the forced migration sort of grow dimmer are you likely to see uh, some kind of softening and if not uh, does that indicate that apart from the event the resentments come from something more primal and tribal or whatever yeah it's a good question i, I no no clear answer you know uh, for that the cases we have in india for example the parsis the baghdadi jews it's too long i mean these we're talking about many many centuries the more recent ones like the tibetan refugees or whether internally displaced or even dam displaced projects it's too recent so i think we have kind of caught up uh, in between having persecuted communities in india who have come very far and who have assimilated very well uh, and uh, sort of groups which are much more recent and who are in the first or second generation and maybe it's too early to tell maybe we'll know 50 years down the line how these groups are doing and one of the major points you make is that a lot of the forced migrations are not just because of partitions uh, or politics they're also because of development projects where people are building dams and people it's huge the numbers are astonishing there's as per one report i mean clearly more people have been displaced because of development induced projects cumulatively than all the partitions put together the three partitions that i say 1937 47 71 uh which is a crazy statistic if you think about it because partition was massive i mean you know you, you have the images of the strains moving across 7 and 1/2 so million people absolutely uh, the the bangladeshi refugee crisis 71 10, 10 million refugees million. in 8 months districts having more refugees than the population of the district themselves short term though uh and we're seeing cumulatively more than 40 million people have been displaced internally so and these are small displacements this could be happening outside your house a small basti being you know sent uh, forcibly uh, uh, demolished and people are on the streets tomorrow but when you actually count this across the country it's quite a staggering number and so for me what's interesting is that often for example the tibetan refugees we've been more hospitable or we've extended more privileges and rights to international refugees because we've been under the scanner than our own internally displaced which is <laughs> some sort of a sort of a Uh, irony no no so you know, it's also indicative of how these are normalized Absolutely. like you imagine 40 million people and you know we are a democracy there would be some kind of movement around this there would be a yeah. cry and so on yeah but the 40 million is an aggregation of many small exactly, ones so we yeah. don't really see it yeah and they don't talk to each and other and it's just oh this is just my bad luck got to yeah, deal yeah. with it some of the dam incidents that i sort of read about were insane i mean some of them were literally flushed out i mean this mm. one fine day the water comes and you know you're forced to leave Uh, so I think course, in Andhra Pradesh, you mentioned the, yeah. the government got confused about when the displacement. What, what is the timing of the uh, the flow of the water? Now, there's of course no no doubt that a lot of these dams have also worked. Uh, there's good that's come out, but then you, you'll have to say that you know what what has been. There has to be a way of you know. I think it's been only very recent that this principle of rehabilitation has been enshrined. Earlier, you could pretty much do what you wanted. Some of the first big dams of India, unfortunately, we don't know what. You know how they went about acquiring land, or how they went about submerging, but clearly there was no process, uh, which means even if you take the if these numbers will also increase if you go before independence, if you start considering the, the really big dams in South India, for example, built in the early 20th century, celebrated today. Uh, but they must have submerged massive, massive amounts of land. No, and I have very little sympathy for sort of cost-benefit analysis of this sort of thing because the cost is normally on one section of people, Absolutely. disproportionately the poor, and the benefit is somewhere. And else. who usually don't get the electricity, don't get the water. Yeah, it, it, and it, it, it's, and, it's and the moral and humanitarian cost is huge to begin with, and then you yeah. know why would you sort of look at uh, uh, benefits? You know, there are a lot of uh, little things in your book which I wanted to talk about, but I've taken up a lot of your time, so I'll kind of go to the bigger questions uh, at. the end uh, one of the very interesting contrasts you make about attitudes towards migrations is the attitudes of ambedkar gandhi and thakre uh, can you tell me a little bit more about that yeah thakre comes across as this staunch nativist uh, of course he is a brilliant strategist so he used opportunities for you know uh, talking about migration but like trump like any staunch nativist basically saying your people first immigrants are uh, something to be looked against often even attacked uh, you know shivsenics have also attacked people on this issue uh, and it's sporadic you know i mean i mean it in the sense the the violence is sporadic but the basic ideology is that uh, our people first and when you think of cities as sites it's strange because mumbai for example is you know, it's a city built by migrants for migrants even today about 60% of the population is migrant thakre himself was a migrant thakre himself was migrant and thakre's surname for example is anglicized and yeah. you know 
has got this will uh, you make peace bal tak exactly so <laughs> so it's and now his movie is being played by you know Nawazuddin uh, uh, Muslim migrant from UP it just doesn't get more bizarre <laughs> or ironic than uh, in fact when you were growing up did you ever feel victimized by his tirades because you're from Udipi right and you were in Mumbai yeah so we have an interesting family story to this uh, our surname for example uh, is direct sort of uh, fallout of this uh, we used to live in Shivaji Park and I believe family friends I was not of course there at that time but this is, these are stories passed on in the family and we used to apparently our, our building was neighboring thakri so as you all very cordial relations uh, and obviously i mean he was a very nice guy on a personal mm-hmm. basis so you know nobody had hard feelings against that uh, but in this whole anti south indian movement in the 1960 uh, eventually we actually had to uh, rather strategically change our surname and we took this name tumbe because it sounds maharashtrian mm-hmm. right? and so tumbe because there's a tembe and a tambe mm-hmm. but we are the only tumbes in the world Uh, and you are literally the only to me literally the only, you I, can google it we are, we, there's nobody else <laughs> i will go on facebook <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah so this is a remarkable story that thanks to the thakrees you know we, we sort of uh, uh, changed our surname and uh, it's because he's got our, our surname changed i mean this is of course uh, in jest because you know, he didn't have a direct uh, connection uh, the city's name has changed but his surname has not so <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, and and tell me also then a, a bit about. Uh, and I should say, Tumbe is the name of a village in Odupi. Yeah. Ah, right. Uh, tell me also a bit about uh, you know, given that urbanization is basically a process of migration. Tell me a bit about Ambedkar and Gandhi's views on uh, contrasting views on urbanization. Like you've quoted Ambedkar famously as calling the Indian village quote a sink of localism, a den of ignorance, narrow-mindedness, and communalism. Stop quote. And Gandhi, perhaps inspired by Ruskin and Tolstoy, and um, all those guys sort of deified the village and in fact he seemed to i mean if you read hind swaraj for example i had a couple of episodes on gandhi with ram guha where we discussed this almost seems to be against so much of modernity like railways like doctors and whatever but gandhi's approach to urbanization was a sort of a complete contrast and you've sort of very nicely exposed the counterplay between these three approaches yeah uh, see, gandhi himself was a migrant uh, i don't think he had a opposition to migrants and as i mentioned he's, he's on record saying that if people are being oppressed then they should move so he he doesn't have a really problem with that uh, but i think his ultimate disdain for cities came about because i think he was more in sync with the village life and also i think at heart he had this idea of being an environmentalist at a way you know i mean he's not called an environmentalist then but i think it's the harmony the and even today you'll find this return to this idea of environmentalism that you know this the rural life is is much more as is, is less polluting etc uh in the book i make my position very clear that i take the ambedkar right view uh that india needs more urbanization not less more people have to move to cities and ultimately it's coming from ambedkar's perspective because if you look at caste wise urbanization you know people if you look at social groups as these small concentric circles it's the well off have these wide spatial networks they are concentric circles span the world and the social groups where the social these concentric circles just span a few villages or or bay and if india really has to flourish one these so- concentric circles have to start interacting but they also have to start widening and that's what migration brings about and so what india really needs is more rural to urban migration of course of the safe kind not exploitative and so on but to have a blanket policy saying you know uh we should uh, have reverse migration or uh, uh let's Uh, and the other thing is i think what people have failed in this gandhian world of rural development is the basic flaw in the ideology that is rural development almost always gets more gets you more migration that is as people get rich in rural areas they actually leave and you've seen this in coastal andhra uh, where people get very rich high productivity and they start moving to hyderabad us because as you get richer you're not going to do farm work you're not going to do back beating from it's a basic Muslim and you law. want to be part of larger economic networks absolutely so i'm not against rural development obviously but my sort of view is that with rural development you will get more migration and that should not be seen as a failure of what you're trying to do but just as an inevitable part of a sort of development and you see it in china it's got tremendous benefits people moving from villages to cities um, and you know you're seeing it in india it's still very slow in india compared to in china because as i say in this book the great indian migration wave means people also go back so it's not that people are coming and settling in indian cities i mean a lot of them 
spend their life here but they go back uh so india in a way has an inbuilt check on permanent migration uh i argue mostly it's coming from the source region women are moving less some of it is also housing high exorbitant costs people can never really put a foot in the city uh so these three views of the nativist of the completely sort of celebratory account of migration safe migration which is ambedkar and gandhi in the middle where he loves the idea of you know uh, ideas moving about or even people moving about but fundamentally the focus is always on the village and if possible there should be no cities everyone should be living in a village and ambedkar would never support that and the three positions are for me very fascinating uh, and for ambedkar of course the crux of this was caste in the sense that if you move to the city you would sort of weaken your caste identity now it's a good question to us has caste really disappeared once you move to the city and i don't think so but i would argue it's less i think that that's the whole point when you talk about urbanization it's not a panacea for anything there's no magic pill but as you point out in your book if you're traveling on the crowded where are local you don't have time to see what the caste of the guy next it to is you relatively is. less it is and, definitely and there's a lot of evidence now suggests that the anonymity it helps on entrepreneurship it helps a variety of things uh, so overall this this romantic idea which policy makers in india have held for a long time that is you know if we do enough in rural areas people won't have to move is fundamentally flawed in fact if you do enough in rural areas people will still move and the rural and areas will also then consolidate into urban areas absolutely yeah and which is happening you know you see these right. small uh, townships and so on uh, emerging right you know one of the very interesting things that you say in your book uh, which kind of seems obvious now in the light of current events but f- if you told me this 15 years ago it would have seemed very counterintuitive and i would have said no way which is that just as you pointed out the major ideological battle of the 20th century was between capitalism and communism your sense is that in the 21st century is likely to be between cosmopolitanism and nativism which we see playing out uh, all around us but is nevertheless still a little surprising to me because you'd imagine that as we become more urban, urbanized and cosmopolitan and globalized yeah. there'll be less chance for nativism to rear its ugly head actually i mean we, this is not completely new i think i mean i use that sentence just because in the 20th century capitalism communism was very strong but you did for a brief moment in the early 20th century also have this battle between nativism and cosmopolitanism for example after the great depression or actually after first world war there were these massive racist visa walls that e- emerged blocking off you know migration flows uh, in europe and and us so this is not the first time you know, they have been people like trump before but because this economic ideological battle is pretty much done and dusted with there might be new ones which might emerge in the century and because we have this massive backlash against globalization uh, remember it's a, it's more of ba- backlash against globalization of people uh, there is of course the trade war and the capital flow war but between the movement of people goods and money or capital the political sort of opposition is f- towards the first slightly less against the second and on capital nobody's talking about stopping capital flows everyone loves that but it's the people which you know people have a problem against uh and so you know i mean this is a battle that's going to really rage on and we we're seeing it in all the elections across the world in india where immigration is such a huge issue it was never a political issue for a central election this time you know it it also uh, mattered uh, to some extent uh and so i argue that of course there's a bias i myself happen to be born in mumbai most cosmopolitan city of india maybe asia uh but i in this book is a celebratory account of cosmopolitan it's it's a defense of that we benefit from ideas transferring some of these ideas may not be good but you know you might even have counter ideas coming from these exchange flows and i think history serves as a nice reminder that especially for social groups to rise migration is very important and if not for any other reason i think that's one of the reasons why one should support mobility towards the end of your book uh, you uh, start off by saying that there are at least three major developments that you foresee in the 21st century uh, tell me about them so the first of course is the north to south migration this has started in bits but it's going to increase and the reason is because the earlier linguistic barrier hindi speakers trying to learn south indian language is kind of broken partly because now the wage difference is so high that people don't mind learning these languages and so you're finding you know bhojpuri bengali speakers who are learning tamil who are learning malayalam or who are working without these languages because they're desperate for good wages and they're getting very good wages 
the added benefit being that the South has better labor laws. So they're actually also getting better labor protection than working in, say, Gujarat or Maharashtra. It's practically the opposite of Hindi imposition. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so they're getting a good deal by migration. Now, you might get a backlash. So you have, like you have this, uh, the Kannada Rakshika Vedike in Bangalore. Until now, you've not seen any political movements against migrants, thankfully. Uh, but this is definitely a feature. Uh, and so the Great Indian Migration Wave, which I argue went east, 19th century, west, 20th century, is now going south. Uh, then there's a the point of climate, climate change. And you're seeing you know, crazy temperature variations. It's going to affect agriculture. Historically, migration has obviously been linked. Even the Arthur Shastra has a mention of uh, what kingdoms should do in terms of famine, move the kingdom to another place and so on. So that's, you know, worry, uh, climate change, especially because the flooding, you know, if the sea levels rise and so on, Bangladesh is a low-lying place. And so that's like a, you know, huge uh, hotspot of migration. Uh, and third is, of course, also expats, you know, a lot of international immigrants coming into India. And so far we've had Nepalis and Bangladeshis in large numbers. But with India growing, you'll also see immigrants coming from Europe and US. You see that in a few cities but it's still in the few thousands. And this could dramatically grow up in 2050. You might find, you know, you're walking down a street in Bombay uh, and you might find literally a lot of races which you're not seeing today. In a way, it would be a return to the late 19th century. Maybe Bom- Thakur's descendants could meet other Thakur's. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you never know. They could also marry outside. You know, yeah. They'll have a transnational uh, uh, family. Thakur family. Yeah, you never know. Uh, but Bombay was so cosmopolitan. When you read Bombay's history late 19th century, you had communities from across the world in Bombay. And uh, you could probably see that again in the, in the next 50 years. Makes me feel even better about uh, living in and loving the city. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> uh, one final question. Uh, did the process of writing this book change how you look at India? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I've always loved this place because it just, I mean, it's cliched, but it is true that it's just so beautifully diverse and you just learn something every day. I think Ram Goa said that, you know, this is the, the most fascinating country, something like that. And I completely agree. And I have had the opportunity to travel a fair bit in the world. And every time you travel in India, it's just something new that, you know, opens up. Uh, Writing history, especially for a general audience, has been really fun. And uh, also a real eye-opener. Because there are many aspects of history where, uh, you know, I also had certain preconceived notions. And when I was, you know, I sort of dug in more, I realized, okay, hang on. You know, uh, I need to sort of uh, look at this in a very, very different way. Um, so, yes, I think it, it's been a very fun process overall. And uh, don't ask me if I'm writing another book. <laughs> Are you writing another book? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, but yeah, it's, it'll take some time. Jinmay, thanks so much for coming on the scene. And thanks so much for having me over. If you enjoyed listening to the show, do hop on over to your nearest online or offline bookstore and pick up India Moving by Chinmay Tumbe. You can follow Chinmay on Twitter at Chinmay Tumbe, one word. You can follow me at Amit Verma, A-M-I-T-V-A-R-M-A. You can browse past episodes of The Scene and the Unseen at sceneunseen.in, thinkpragati.com and ivmpodcast.com. The Scene and the Unseen is supported by the Takshishila Institution, an independent center for research in education and public policy. Takshishila offers 12-week courses in public policy, technology policy and strategy strategic studies for both full-time students and working professionals. Visit takshishila.org.in for more details. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Satyajit. Hi, I'm Racheta. We are from the Open Library Project and we host a podcast called Paperback. Paperback is a podcast where we engage with stalwarts and experts from various industries, suggesting non-fiction titles that contributed to their journey in a big way. We've had guests like Anjali Rena, Dr. Marcus Rani, Dr. Swati Loda, Ambi Parmeswaran, Apurva Damani and many more on our show Paperback. Find new episodes every Wednesday on IVM Podcast app, website or wherever you listen to podcasts. Hey Krupa, check out my beatboxing. Boots and cats and boots and cats. Hey man, and please boots stop. Cats. All right, check out my singing. No, I'm serious. Stop. But why? Because you're genuinely bad, and because we've got actual talent to showcase.
presenting the ATKT Talent Time podcast where I Krupa and I P man chat with some immensely talented college students about the fun part of college like freshers life the music and poetry scene side hustles for college students and the not so fun like we are dress codes hostel deadlines and ragging new episodes every tuesday on the IVM podcast app the IVM podcast website and wherever else you get your podcasts from hey Krupa Check out my poetry. Roses are red. No. Violets no, are blue. No, 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 no. You are special. Please.